Well, thank you to everyone for coming on a Friday night. Um, and thank you, and yes. I have to say, when I moved to New York 20 years ago, I never thought I would meet my husband at the Strand, which I hoped, but it happened. <laughs> and I never thought I'd be interviewing two of the most important uh, chefs of our generation. So it's a super treat. Um, so Eric, you were generous enough to bring David to New York 10 years ago. I mean, that, that was kind of his first introduction to the food media because, you know, food writers can be kind of lazy. They maybe go to Napa or Yountville, but they're not going to go to Los Gatos. Sorry. But, you know, <laughs> especially in 2003, 2004. But you tasted his food, and just tell us a little bit about that discovery and why you wanted to share him. Yes, so uh, um, I was uh, in 2003 doing um, a food and wine event in uh, Carmel. That was at the time very boutique and, and, and very special event, bringing all the best chefs of the country. And um, uh, some friends were saying to me, you know, it, it's a guy in Los Gatos. I didn't even know where it was on the map. Not like it doesn't exist, but my ignorance. Um, uh, it's two hours from from more or less, right? For, um, hour and a half. Hour and a half. Uh, well, it took us it took us two hours, but <laughs> <laughs> um, easy to get there, and, hard to drive back. And and supposedly the chef was great and the food was amazing was just uh, opening his restaurant not too long ago and so on so I went there um, with a friend and I was like having an, an epiphany with the food and uh, and, uh, and uh, fell in love with the food of David and uh, and the style and, and, and the quality of the products and everything else and then I talked I went back to Carmel and I said you know David, two hours away, he should be in a festival with us. He should be. And they were like, no, he's too close, he's too this, he's too... I was like, that's not cool. Um, <laughs> because, because he's one of the greatest uh, uh, talents uh, in America, and I think he deserves he deserve recognition, and he should be with us for the festival. So then I came back to New York. Long story short. I mean, it's a long story, sorry. Um, uh, and when I came back to New York, I, I wanted to really um, uh, help David to have recognition, at least from the press. At the time, you were at the New York Times. I just started. I've been there for a couple of months. And you, ca you came to the, the, the lunch, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and suddenly, cre actually, actually, you wrote about David. I was the only one. No, uh, Alan Richman wrote okay. about well, it. Well, Alan has, yeah. yeah. Alan and you. Christine was the first one. And uh, the first one that first one nationally to, to yeah. try to but yeah, that was her I, I job was, I was then. there in two weeks yeah. I mean I couldn't wait and uh, and so we did a little press lunch for David I mean we didn't do anything we just gave him the kitchen and, and the room and then say good luck <laughs> 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 and, um, and 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 you wrote about it and then the rest is history yeah. well it was just it was so inspiring you know, of course we all came because of Eric, and then David just blew our collective minds. And you know, for me and and for others who were there that I've talked to since then, you know, all the food was great, and then the dessert came out, and it was and it's in the book. It's just like a bowl. It looked like a bowl of orange segments in a way. It was like, oh, whoops, that we were doing so well here. <laughs> <laughs> but each one was a different variety, and it was the most flavorful thing that, I mean, I know, you didn't even know that those many varieties existed, and it was just his dedication and the relationship he had with that particular hobbyist, not even a farmer, and it was just, it was just, it was a revelation, and it kind of makes you wonder, what are we doing in New York, and, you know, let's go see what he's doing. So what was it like for you? 10 years ago, I mean, it seems like eons ago. Um, well, it feels like 20, <laughs> but this is. Um, Los Gatos, Los Gatos uh, it's not completely in the middle of nowhere, but it is quite a bit off the beaten path. Uh, it's actually closer to San Jose. Um, then San Francisco, it's about halfway between San Francisco and Monterey, uh, but it is in the heart of Silicon Valley, which uh, I had hoped would be a big part of my client base. Uh, my timing was impeccable in opening the restaurant in the midst of the biggest tech collapse, you know, uh, in a long time. And the restaurant really struggled uh, from, you know, 2000, we opened in July of 2002. Uh, we have uh, not as much as here in New York, but we were impacted 
uh, by the psyche of of 9/11 and the tech collapse, which all happened within six months of each other. And we had been planning the restaurant for several years, and we invested a lot of money. We bought the land, we bought the building, so we made a real commitment to be where we were. <coughs> And the first years uh, were quite the struggle. It took a, uh, there was periods where it was really scary and really intense. Um, uh, the main reason why I asked Eric to write the uh, the intro is because uh, I have tremendous amount of respect for him in what he did in reaching out and giving us a chance to succeed on a national stage. <laughs> of which I'm forever grateful. It was also that luncheon where I happened to meet Christine and we have become friends. Uh, we met professionally, we became, socially we became friends over the, and uh, her comments, uh, some comments and emails that she wrote to me about two years ago was uh, uh, very important in actually getting the, the book written. Uh, but the restaurant, we've, you know, we've slowly expanded. You know, that's what we did. We just kind of hung on and got a little bit better each year. We expanded the staff a little bit and, and became a little bit more ambitious every year. Uh, about two and a half years ago, we did a major renovation in which we built a bar and a lounge and we changed the whole footprint of the building, changed the entryway, built another dining room, closed up an old entry, built a wine cellar, uh, and uh, that's continuing to this day. Uh, uh, you'll, you know today, even before my investors, that I'm renovating the kitchen completely in two and a half years. We're doing a brand new kitchen, so uh, hopefully they don't find out through this uh, through, <laughs> through a podcast Thanks or something. But um, <laughs> so um, um, and the other big major factor was in 2005, 2006 in in creating the role uh, and the relationship with Love Apple Farms, a woman named Cynthia Sandberg. <laughs> who started with a very small property and has now moved to a large property. And that really changed the ethos of the restaurant and how we approach things, right menus, and, and the experience in, that we offer to our guests. Great. Well, it's been, it's been an amazing story to watch because it's not, I mean, it's sort of like a, a slow overnight success, but just to see someone through hard work and perseverance and, you know, not a lot of slick TV appearances no, and, you know, but just to really, someone to keep, well, that came, but that came after 20, 25 years, you know, but just the, the slow overnight success and having the world, you know, realize the great, the great treasure that was kind of hidden there. Um, and I think that's really inspiring. And also to have a best-selling cookbook, you know. <laughs> that's, it's, the, the book has been, uh, the book is a real interesting story how, you know, it, I guess every chef at some point in time wants to write a cookbook. You know, it's, you know, you want to get your message out there and you have things you want to share. We, by nature, tend to be pretty generous and want to share things with, with the public, people who pay money to come to our restaurants. And I've always wanted to do a book. And uh, Ten Speeds in my neighborhood, you know, they're in, they were in Berkeley, now based in Emeryville, and they're in the East Bay. They're not far from us. And I've known Aaron for years, and I always told Aaron, I want to write a book. I want to write a book. And Aaron was always like, um, no, no. You know, I'd write a proposal, and he'd say, you know, this is, no, no. You know, you're not quite ready kind of thing and about three years ago you know I was having a glass of wine in the city with Aaron and everything and just out of the blue he said you know you're ready and I'm said ready for what he says I think you're ready for the cookbook I think now is the time for the cookbook and I thought that was really interesting and then I found myself in New York a, a week or two later and uh, I, I think you guys tag team me. In retrospect, I think you tag team me because Christine, just out of the blue, said to me, she said, you know, if you ever decide to write a cookbook, I'd be happy to help you with it. I'd be, I would love to help you write it. And there was a conflux of factors that came together that made it the intuitive, organic thing to do at that time. And before, I would try to write book proposals and I would turn in book proposals. And frankly, even I wasn't happy with the proposals that I was turning in. I just felt I had to do it because that's what a chef does. They open up a restaurant and then they write a book. And in my mind, you know, Aaron was very smart and waiting because uh, we didn't necessarily want to do a cookbook just as a collection of recipes. We wanted to tell a story, and that's what came out. It came out in a very, very natural way also. Uh, it wasn't anything really forced. I think that 
it tells the story of the restaurant, but more importantly, we had been open 12 years, and we had our trials and, uh, trials and tribulations, but we also had our successes also. So there was an actual story to tell, and I think that's part of the appeal of the book coming out now, as opposed to five or seven years ago. So the two of you, one would think that you're both inspired very differently, but I'd love to know a little bit about when and where you create and where it comes from. Because I sort of picture you here in the city and then him there stopping at the farm on his way to work. Yeah, well, I mean, not only that, first, the first thing he does is goes, he goes surfing, <laughs> <laughs> right? Every morning you go almost. Oh, like actually, you make believe when I'm there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he borrows his neighbor's but surfboard. You, you go surfing, and then you pass by the farm. And then um, what I'm very impressed uh, is what you have done with the garden uh, or, or the farm. And, and it basically dictates the, the menu of David, and it, it inspires you for the menu of today and, and tomorrow you will be something else and so on. So your inspiration is really um, coming from the region and what is seasonal and what is in that garden. And um, I, I, I have spent time with you and I have seen vegetables that I have never seen anywhere else and, and uh, uh, produce and, and uh, fruits and f flowers and edible flowers and herbs and so on. Um, so it's, in my opinion, it's what inspires you the most. Here um, at Le Bernardin, we have no garden, and uh, uh, we are a seafood restaurant. So um, we are inspired by the beautiful products that we can find, uh, either either way, uh, in Maine or at the market in New York or from from Japan or other countries. Um, but inspiration coming for me comes from the surrounding. Uh, so, being in New York, I, I feel very fortunate to be able to to um, uh, meet people from other countries, test their food, uh, learn new techniques, be able to um, interact with people fr from um, again different cultures, and, and we use different techniques as, as uh, than, than mine. Um, I have the luck to to travel as well. I just come back from Korea, and my head is like. I'm Korean. <laughs> uh, the challenge is not to make Le Bernardin Korean. <laughs> um, so in between the, the interaction that we have in New York, and, and as you know, it's a big melting pot of cultures and so on, and in between the traveling, that inspires uh, what I do. And but also, I mean, sometimes you think about dishes during your walk to work or yes, well listening I, to music. I, instead of going to... Well, listening to music, <laughs> I don't know where you're going. <laughs> um, instead of going surfing, I, I walk in Central Park every morning for 45 minutes every day. And, uh, and that clear my mind and also sometimes inspiration comes like that. Uh, the music used, <laughs> I know what you're referring to and it's okay, it's not a secret. Um, uh, I, I don't do it anymore as much as, you, as I used to do, but I used to go to clubs, um, dance clubs, uh, to listen to techno. So the DJ was very good at 6 a.m. You know, he was starting at midnight, but by the time it hits his head, it was six. Um, and I will go to the club from six to one or six to two, dance with some friends, get inspired, uh, <laughs> and then I will go have lunch with my wife at Pastis, actually. <laughs> um, but those days are, are over. I mean, if I go dance like that for six hours, my back hurts. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> Maybe we can get you some really good speakers for your Yeah, we, yes. Well, at, at, at home I dance, yes. <laughs> An inspiration for you? Uh, the, uh, the garden is, is is a major part of the inspiration, uh, but um, you know we don't have the melting pot of New York. But you know other cultures, uh, travel is is really important to me. Is travel and uh, one of the things I like to do when I travel is to, is to hit the markets, to hit the central market wherever we're going. Usually it's really convenient because you're suffering jet lag. You know you're up early anyway. It's a great idea to get a, a good idea of what's going on. Uh, a lot of travel is usually restaurant related. It's an event or something like this. So, you know, it, it would benefit me to go to the market and see what's available. Maybe even change ingredients around and that sort of thing. Um, but it's it's almost anything. Reading, eating in other people's restaurants, I find inspirational. You see new ideas, what your peers are doing. Um, smell, you know, smells in markets, you know, aroma. 
it really does a lot to me, you know, in terms of at least thinking about how flavors work together and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I'd say reading, travel, and the garden are the main main culprits. That's interesting because you talk about aroma and memory as inspiration for you based on your childhood. Sure, I th I think especially when we are young, we have those those imprints in our uh, mind and uh, we keep that all our life and uh, i have very vi vivid memories of going to in provence to a market with uh, my grandmother and and the smell of basil come um, you will be uh, uh, hundred yards away from the market and you will smell the basil um, and that basil doesn't sell that doesn't smell the same as the basil we find here or testing artichokes and and uh, having memories of artichoke flavor today in my mind and then when I eat an artichoke the artichoke here is not the same as the one from the French Riviera or something or Italy or something like that but to, to talk about David I mean what impressed me the most David is is that it's your understanding of um, the vegetables that uh, are in, in that garden. And I remember asking you the question and saying, David, but is it a difference in between the vegetables that you grab now and, and in one hour is going to be uh, cooked in, in, in your restaurant and the vegetables that potentially I could find in, in um, Union Square? And the and answer was immediate. You say, of course, look at this vegetable is live in two hours. He's going to start to die in four hours. He's dead. Uh, that might sound really n new age Californian, but if you, if you, we all know that if you, you buy a ripe tomato, uh, one of the first things you do is you don't store it in a fridge. People don't tell you to put it in the fridge. You put it in a cool, cool place where air can circulate around it, but you certainly don't chill it down because when you chill a tomato down, it immediately loses the aroma. It loses that 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 aroma and texture of it being in contact with the sun and the refrigerator kills that and it makes the flavor a little bit mushy and it starts to break down you know the everything starts to break down and a tomato is a real extreme example but i you know i firmly believe through experience that uh, it's the same thing with with vegetables and fruits also maybe not to an extreme degree but i think a carrot a leek an onion garlic uh, a peach i think the minute that you go into that cold box you know of of uh, 36 to 40 degrees you are denuding it uh, of, of it might be only 15 percent of its flavor and its aroma but it's that that's the crucial 15 percent that separates it between a very good product and something that is truly exceptional i think about how david has um annual dinners one based around the tomato and all of the courses are, I mean, how many courses do you, are you doing? I mean, about 10, wow. 10 to 12 courses. And then also the Desserts are getting hard after all these years. <laughs> it's like no more tomato desserts, but. Right, yeah. and citrus. Um, so if you were to create a menu around one ingredient, what would it be? Uh, except seafood. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. How about one fish? Ten courses. Oh, it's like a fugu menu. I will, like I will take a menu. big fish, like a tuna, because mm. yeah. it's it's many cuts yeah. and many ways of, pr of preparing. And you, you pr in between the the head and the jaw, you say the jaw, jaw, mm. jaw, whatever. Here, <laughs> um, and 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 the neck and the, and the loin and the, I think tuna could be and the belly of course the toro mm. um, tuna could be the, the the right ingredients to have fun. Yeah. It's and so funny. It's the, uh, the these restaurants in Japan that just specialize in fugu, and every course it's Blue fish. it's a multi-course uh, menu, and every course has a bit of this fish, and you wonder why. But you know, there's different cooking techniques for each one, and you know. They use the fin, they use the different parts, even the skin, that sort of stuff. And you say, well, why would a restaurant do this? It seems like it's so one note, but you know, it's just such an exploration of an ingredient that you really know the whole story of the fish. You know everything about it. Uh, and maybe just only once in a lifetime, but still, I think it's fascinating that these restaurants thrive like that, we f day in and day out. It's pretty amazing. And we have Brooks Headley here tonight from Del Posto. Maybe he can talk. Yay. Think about a tuna dessert. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Eggplant. <laughs> 
Great. And both of you have had incredible mentors. Um, Eric, I mean, you worked with Joel Robuchon, you worked with Gilbert Lacoge, Jean-Louis Paladin, you worked with Barry Wine at Quilted Giraffe and, and Mark Vero, or I'm sorry, Mark Minot at L'Esperance. So how are you transmitting that knowledge and your knowledge to the next generation? Uh, just talk a little bit about mentorship and how you do that in the kitchen. Um. Well, this is the Time Magazine. Oh, no, oh no. that thing. Did I touch it, the wire? No, it's um, the. Um, I think one of the things that cooks, I would like to see more in cooks nowadays is an understanding of the history of the profession, what came before them, because it's going to make them better cooks. To understand who really great American chefs were, who the great European chefs were that made the contribution to allow every, them to be where they are now. And what it does, it lets them know that you know, they're just a link in a chain. They're not a bigger link than any other chain, but there were links that came before them, and there's gonna be links after them, and I think they will become better cooks if they understand, you know, what their role is in the industry and the profession, that they are learning, they're benefiting from all the hard work and the knowledge gained and uh, from the past. They're benefiting from that, and it is their responsibility to pass that on to young cooks. Now, when you're a line cook, or you're just starting out and you're in the trenches, that might be the furthest thing from your mind, and I understand. But I think, you know, as you move up in your career and you take on management positions, whether it's a sous chef or even an executive chef or, or, or an owner, you become an owner of your own place, you do realize that the easiest part of your day is the cooking, and, and the hardest part is managing and motivating people to get them to share your vision and to to accomplish the goal that you're all setting out to do which is to make customers happy and part of getting that done sometimes is 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 passing on their informa information your knowledge responsibility not only so they share the information perhaps that they can pass it on and it, it's hard to do it's hard to do You've had a really impressive roster of people come out of the restaurant in a really, I mean, in 10 years. I mean, it's its really interesting to see. Well, you're usually only as good as the people that work for you, so it behooves me to, to train people correctly uh, because I will benefit from it. Great, and how do you transmit your knowledge? Um, we try to keep the cooks in the restaurant in between three to five years minimum, and um, ob obviously they're not prisoners they can leave at any time <laughs> indentured servitude <laughs> but um, uh, uh, three years is a minimum or, or two and a half years is a minimum because they all start um, in an easy station and then it takes them two years two year, two, uh, about two years to end up at the sauce station and the sauce station is the most uh, um, esoteric um, station in the kitchen and uh, I, I will be very brief but you have basically you captivate flavors in something that is liquid and you have to keep it at the same consistency at all time, right? At 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, it has to be the same. It has to be vibrant and so on. So to, to be able to teach that to a cook, it takes a long time. Um, so we have this program in Le Bernardin where you start and you go from station to station and you deal with the sous chefs, um, less with me, uh, because we try to to create a, a kind of a reward um, if you stay longer. So I interact less with the beginners than I interact with um, the sociers and the sous chefs. However, when they become sociers and sous chefs, suddenly the interaction becomes very intimate. When I say intimate, it means that we, we um, uh, it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, for the sauce, and then uh, with the sous chef, we meet almost every day. We have a conference room, um, kind of a library, and we meet and we discuss creativity. We have a team that is dedicated to creativity that interact with them and, and myself. And um, uh, we also discuss um, 
uh, not only the cooking but the human aspect of managing people um, and uh, and basically um, their success is our success their failure is our failure so th that's the way we go and uh, um, luckily we keep the the, the cooks we they, they're still interested uh, to stay with us for those three year period and then it's another another cycle is a cycle of management they become sous chefs and then we they have to stay two more years uh, or commit to two more years if they want that and we teach them that so mentoring is a it's it's a long term relationship in a sense um, and it's um, it's something that you share with with obviously your cooks and it's something that sometimes it's you cannot explain it's just um, a chemistry um, it, it, you can verbally talk about it but whatever you feel and sense suddenly the, you can without talking um, teach it to your to your cook and and then suddenly start to think and feel like you especially the socier because socier is the first time when we're not talking about pure craftsmanship we're talking about something different pure craft craftsmanship is knife skills um, it's it's uh, everything um, architectural in a plate and then when you talk about sauce it's no more no more of that it's suddenly another dimension flavors which don't exist I mean if you put flavors in your mind and try to measure flavors all of us here I mean we can't say oh I'm gonna put one ounce of basil flavor in my sauce it's 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 like notes of music they don't exist they all here so anyway I'm stopping <laughs> and what's the what what are some what's one of the greatest lessons that that you were taught by any of the chefs that you worked with is there something that you tell the cooks in your restaurant well sure I mean I, I learned sauce with uh, I think Robuchon was um, a great master at, at uh, making sauce and, and probably the toughest master um, or, or teacher um, and it took me years and years and years to understand what he was trying to to teach me I spent three years with him but I left after three years I still didn't get it <laughs> I was a bit slow so um, it's really it's really it was when I was with Jean-Louis Paladin in the US that I started to have a an idea about what he was, what, what my mentor Robuchon was talking about, and then uh, with David Boulet, the, uh, I started to understand a bit better. And then at Le Bernardin is when I really finally wanted to say, Ah, I got it. Um, and then that today is my job is to ob obviously to share that um, again with with the the cooks who give uh, years of their life and, and sacrifice um, because the salaries are not huge and, and it's a lot of hard work and uh, it's in, f in a sense uh, the duty of the chef to share that with, with his uh, um, cooks, alumnas. Is there still a piece of advice that you still hear in your head in the kitchen or something that you pass on to your cooks? Uh, working clean really freaks me out when people don't work clean. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Who taught you that? Was that Barry? Um, all the good ones along the way. You know, it's like if you work clean, uh, you're 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 organized. You, you can't be organized and not clean. It's it's just not possible. So. So both of you are, are rare in that you're celebrated chefs who have only one restaurant in their primary city. What is that like? What do your friends say about that? <laughs> and is that going to change? David? Uh, I'm working on a plan for a bakery right now. We um, have a pretty ambitious bread program at the restaurants. We've been doing some farmer's markets locally and it's gone kind of viral. Uh, and uh, we're in the process of opening up uh, a small wholesale retail baking operation. In yeah. Santa Cruz or Los Gatos? It'll be in the South Bay. It'll be in the South Bay. You know, non-commodity wheat, you know, which is really exciting. The buzzword here. for 2014, yeah. by the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll be hearing more about that. That's not cool. Well, yeah. you heard it here first. Yeah. And how does it feel, I mean, when you go to some of these conferences or just having one restaurant, that's right, why is that right for you? 
Well, uh, it was, it's been right for me because up until about now, because uh, uh, I probably wasn't smart enough to open a second restaurant. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, all my time was dedicated to, to trying to make Manresa to a place where I was really happy with it and comfortable with with uh, how the restaurant was going. And the past two or three years, I feel like I've felt a really good comfort level with the direction the restaurant's going in. And that has allowed me to start thinking about some side projects like the bakery and perhaps a, a second more casual place. You know, which I would like to I would like to do. You only live once. You know, like try it at some point. But uh, I, you know, I. It's all my energy has been devoted to Manresa. I can't imagine how I could have done it otherwise. Past couple of years. And Eric, you've had you've had other projects, and now you're focusing again. Yeah, well, I never lost focus on Le Bernardin, but um, yeah, I tried um, to open, I mean, we actually, I didn't try, we opened restaurants, one in Philadelphia, one in Washington, one in Cayman, um, and then I didn't have fun doing that. It was not rewarding to me. Um, I have a lot of fun at Le Bernardin, and uh, it was, in. Uh, <laughs> It was uh, kind of stressful for me. I was, it was something that was on, with me on the morning when I was drinking my coffee, thinking about Le Bernardin and other restaurants, and during the day, and then I was going to bed thinking about also the other restaurants and so on, and then potentially sometimes I was flying. Uh, obviously, you have to go visit the, the places, and then I was or in a train or something like that, and I, I didn't really enjoy it, and um, I, I sat down and. and reflect and say, you know what, I'm very happy with Le Bernardin. Um, I don't need the other restaurants. So now, it's very personal, obviously. Um, so when I, go, when I go to bed at night, I'm very happy, <laughs> content. Um, and, and then I think, if, if you were asking the question, the same question to um, chefs that I respect tremendously, like Daniel or Jean-Georges, or, um, or even uh, Thomas or, or Ducasse uh, or, or Robuchon, um, they, they will say, look, I'm, I will, uh, they will be so bored maybe, you know, that they, they need to open up the restaurant, they have fun and so on. Um, so it's a matter of personality and a, and a matter of how you want to conduct your life and, and, and to have a level of contentment and uh, I'm very content and I have no intention whatsoever to open another restaurant somewhere else. Good. So last question because... That's lazy. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because also because we're here, but yeah, I, I have to say something about it. one of the a lot of people may not understand this or know this, but one of the things I have amazing respect about Eric about there's two th there's many things, but two that really important. <clears throat> and the first one is is that when Eric started Le Bernardin, he took it over the restaurant in fairly tragic. Uh, circumstances in that uh, the owner and founder, uh, a larger than life chef that created this amazing restaurant in New York, the founder of Le Bernardin, Gilbert Lacoz. And Eric was tapped at a pretty young age to take over this restaurant, which became an institution immediately. And I don't know anybody who would have wanted that job to take over and follow in Gilbert's foot because it was a position where you were destined to fail and not succeed. There was no way anybody in their right mind would take that and be able to do that. And Eric did that. Eric not only kept the reputation and the four stars and the family intact and, and Maggie happy and all that, but they have grown and they have grown upon that foundation that Gilbert originally put into place. And I, I just, when I think about Eric, I, it's, it's almost unimaginable the pressure of taking that over because it's like, how can you succeed in filling those shoes, and such big shoes like that. And Eric did that and then some. Um, the other thing is, um, like all good cooking, and it's one of the things we talk a little bit about in the book, is um, you know a certain sense of balance um, in food, with wine, and overall ambiance. It's never about being over the top or anything like this. Elegance and understatement and refinement and beauty always tend to be more about a moderation and balance of all the complex things that are involved in any one thing. And it's the same thing with 
a chef's life. The older you get, you know, you can't be balls to the wall 24 hours a day. The food will suffer, your staff will suffer, your health will suffer, and it's really key to find that balance where you maintain a healthy lifestyle, an emotional and mental lifestyle, uh, but also to be able to do the work to your own satisfaction. And the win-win part of it is, is that if you do find that balance, I think you end up, it, it helps you professionally. I think it makes you a better chef, and it makes you a better mentor and a better leader in the kitchen, too. And uh, I think Eric has that in spades, and that's one of the things I greatly admire about him, too. Definitely. Definitely. Thank, thank God you didn't tell me that <laughs> after, <laughs> after Gilbert Lagos passed away. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was naive, that's why. <laughs> How old were you again? You were I was 20, 29. Um, but any, anyway, um, um, that's the past, and, and yeah, I was very naive. I had no idea that people were thinking <laughs> that I would fail. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I see many of you have, have Manresa book on, on your lap. And, uh, and I see the um, Rebecca Reek book. And I have to ask one last question because I know both of you are real cookbook collectors. I mean, you talk about how you, when you would come to New York as a student and you'd spend all of your money on the, is it the Grand Livre de Cuisine books? Uh, the, the Robert LaFont series, which was only available in New York at Rockefeller Center in the French American Library in the basement. And uh, I spent a lot of time haunting here and in the basement here. And you yeah. still, I mean, you, like, I've this stayed is, in your guest room. There's kind of a yeah. bed, but they're mostly books. And also in your sub basement in the yes. conference room, it's just it's a, an incredible collection of all of your cookbooks and things that you brought with you from France. And so, what are your desert island cookbooks? Well, the, Manre Two. the Manresa <laughs> one. <laughs> or let's say we're we're in the rare book room. If we if like if people want to look around afterwards and maybe get one score, what's a great classic or beloved book? Well, I love the book of my mentors, um, a Paladin. Jean Louis Paladin had a f an amazing book uh, at the time, and it is hard to find uh, that book. And then Robichon has done many books, but um, I got the first one because I was in, in his kitchen at the time. And um, and uh, today, um, the Manresa book is a great idea for Christmas. <laughs> I have to say, having seen that Robichon book, the um, it's worth it just for the fashion. Like his wife is in this kind of Laura Ashley French, and there's like. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. The, uh, is it the Lafon book or the yeah, the Lafon? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How about you? Uh, a lot of books. I, the uh, the book is a young cook that had a great influence on me. Uh, and really made me realize that you could do anything being a chef was and it's 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 fairly hard to find now uh, I even see if there's a copy here um, it's called it was called the great chefs of France and it came out in about 1978 it was an English author a gentleman named Anthony Blake I believe or and uh, another gentleman named Quentin Crew. One was the photographer, one was the writer. And as a young cook, that was my first introduction to all the, the, the French masters, the European masters. Uh, it was a book about the three star chefs. It had photos of their menus, had them showing visits to the garden. There was long interviews with them. And of course, this was 1978. This was a long, this was before you could just click and, and find. So uh, this book uh, was a big deal for me to have. And I still leaf through it. And it still kind of amazes me reading through it. So we'll all be racing after here. No one can leave until we're done. <laughs> so I think we'll take some questions from the audience. Yeah, we're just about out of time. We have two, one, two question space left. If anybody wants to ask something. Yeah, we'll bring you a mic. I had a two-part two question. One was, why Los Gatos for the restaurant? Um, and then secondly, you talked about surfing. Is there any inspiration from surfing that informs your, your cooking? And who's your favorite surfer? <laughs> um, OK, uh, Los Gatos. Um, I ended up in California. And I, I left New York. I was in New York from 83 to the end of 88. Uh, I went to uh, Japan. I worked in Japan for a couple of months. And I came back. My family had just relocated to California. And I moved to San Francisco just in time for the Loma Prieta earthquake, when it essentially eliminated every job in town for about nine months. Um, 
And I worked in San Francisco for a number of years, uh, um, various different restaurants, uh, worked as sous chefs and uh, became a chef, uh, a chef de cuisine, my first chef de cuisine job there. Uh, but then I wanted to open up a small bistro and I looked all over San Francisco, budget was tight, that sort of thing. And I ended up finding a place that was really perfect for us. And it was in Saratoga. I don't know if you know where Saratoga, but Saratoga is in the South Bay also. It's about five miles from Los Gatos and a uh, little small space. My rent was $1,100 a month you know, sort of thing for, for a 40 seat restaurant. And I was there for about seven or eight years and it did very well. Uh, but the kitchen was very, very tiny. I thought I was going to kill myself. If I worked another year and how, that's how small that kitchen was. And, um, the space in Los Gatos, five miles down the road, opened up and I had a really great intuitive feeling about it. And so, um, Manresa was a relocation of this original, original space, and uh, you know we built built a kitchen to our specs and much more room, much more comfort space, and we made a commitment by buying the land and the building to be there and 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 to to set down roots. Um, and because of that, I moved to Santa Cruz um, because um, I don't think I could do it after living in cities my whole life and traveling all over. Los Gatos and Saratoga wasn't going to do it for me. Saratoga is really great. It's his own little biosphere. I don't know if you've ever been there. You, you have to work hard to get there. It's not, you don't pass through, unless you're going from Half Moon Bay to, to Castroville, you're not going to drive through Santa Cruz. Uh, you have to work to get there. And it's a it's a great town. Um, uh, most varied surf breaks anywhere on, on the coast of California. It's a college town. It's a stoner town. It's carpenters. It's, it's blue collar. Uh, I can park my car. It's it's like it's very rare in California. I can park my car on my days off, and for two or three days, uh, I'll, I won't go back into my car. I can walk to bookshops, restaurants, uh, uh, movie theaters, and you know I really you know I have settled down into that. If I want to go to the big city, I can I can drive to San Francisco. It's about an hour and a half away. So I, I like where I am. I like the position. You know where I live and where the restaurant is is very important. Uh, Surfing is part of the balance that we talk about. You know, have a stressful day. There doesn't even need to be waves. It's just really nice being in the water, especially in the morning. There's a lot of wildlife. Um, uh, it's very calm and contemplative. There's a lot of exercise involved. And, you know, there's something about salinity, you know, and, and you know, we all know what a beach does to us. It makes things go away. It makes a lot of anxiety go away just being in salt air and salt water. And even when it's really, really cold and the sun's just coming up, that still has its effect on me. Um, Joel Tudor. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Any other questions out there this evening? All right, the last one. Um, you talk about sort of inspiring um, the people that work um, for you. Um, and, and making sure that they understand the message that you want to get out. Um, what is that relationship like with your investors? With my investors? Yeah. <laughs> you worried about the bakery. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, part of, you know, I think our kitchen's very collaborative. Our, the kitchen's very collaborative. I ask, I, I think the, the, the worst offense you can have, our kitchen's very small, you know, small crew, but, um, the worst offense in the, in our kitchen is not to have any opinion at all about something. You have to have an opinion. If, if I ask, what do you think about this degree? What would you do with it? If I gave this to you and told you to put a dish on the menu, what would you do with it? That doesn't necessarily have to agree with your idea, but if like, you know, if I get the shrug of the shoulders, if there's if there's nothing going on, uh, it, it's that to me that's a that's a red flag. Everybody has to have an opinion because I ask questions. Uh, we meet every night. The entire staff meets every night. We talk about the menu because ingredients are coming and going so frequently. Um, you know, it's the the, the people in the trenches, they're the ones that really firsthand with with how we can use and how much we have and that sort of thing in, in putting together the menu. So their input's really important to me. Um, uh, the investors, uh, I sold, I sold the investors 
as a real estate deal that happened to have a restaurant on it. And uh, I think they're getting something out of it. I think, you know, there's always an exit strategy with real estate. You know, so they can sell it. They can be landlords. They can do, we can do whatever we want with it at some point in time when, if, when, if ever we decide we don't want to do it anymore. Um, but, you know, I meet with them. I keep them up to date with, with how we go. We have board meetings, that sort of thing. I have a great group of investors. I have some that are not so great. But, you know, I think that's how it is with any any diverse group that comes together. Uh, some, one of the best advice I ever had uh, uh, in the restaurant business was if you ever have the opportunity to start your own restaurant and you have the ability to buy it, buy the space because that might be your opportunity to to retire and not just fall into the endless cycle of you know the purgatory of of restaurant work and uh who's the guy who gave you that advice uh, thomas yeah yeah thomas keller yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's called burying the lead yeah yeah thomas took over the french laundry nobody wanted it i mean because everyone said i mean it was the french laundry space two houses the garden across the, the 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 land across street which is now his garden and a bunch of other places and it, w it was really really prime and a bunch of the best known chefs in the country looked at it for over two years and everybody said it was no expensive it could never work and thomas took the plunge and we all know where he's at now well um not to end on a pun but there's something to be said for putting down roots literally figuratively thank you yuck yuck <laughs> we'll be yeah. here all week thank you Thank you all so much. Thank you on behalf of The Strand, David, Christine, and Eric for joining us. If you haven't already checked out the Menrezo book, we do have copies over by the register. Take care. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.